uh, let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much uh, for your work in our in our lives. We thank you for this uh, privilege, opportunity we have to take time out to read uh, and study your words. And uh, we pray that you would be, uh, that this would not just be a, a hard work, but it would be a joy and a delight for us to know you and your ways. We pray that even this uh, even uh, this evening, that you'd be helping us to persevere in our Christian life, even when it can be hard. Help us to live out our Christian life, um, producing good works. And uh, we pray that you help me to teach uh, faithfully this evening. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, well, we're looking at, uh, firstly, the book of, of Hebrews uh, this evening. And I think, uh, if anything, the, what the book of Hebrews is most famous for is some of those uh, scary uh, warning passages, right? Uh, you know, if a person uh, uh, falls away from Christ, they're like, uh, uh, you know, crucifying the Son of God all over again, and there's no forgiveness, and uh, and these these kinds of uh, things. So, for example, we saw in uh, if we were to go to chapter ten and verse twenty six, we see one of those uh, those scary warning passages. If we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume uh, the adversaries anyone who set aside the law of moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses how much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the son of god who has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he has he was sanctified and has outraged the spirit of grace we know him who said vengeance is mine i will repay and again the lord will judge his people is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living gone so these are the kind of uh uh you know quite scary uh warning passages that uh, uh perhaps uh hebrews is most uh, famous for and of course it's it raises an important question uh this is something that calvinists and arminians uh, uh debate of course is is it is it possible for a a, a christian to um, to fall away. Of course, an Arminian would argue from these very passages that yes, uh, um, of course, Christian can fall away. Otherwise, what's the warning passages is, is about? Uh, but the Calvinist also has to read this passage and think, well, okay, uh, if God perseveres his people, how are we meant to understand uh, uh, the warning passages? Uh, the other thing, of course, that uh, the book of Hebrews is uh, probably famous for is the fact that we don't really know who wrote the book. And um, that it's it's formally anonymous, and uh, that has has uh, raised all kinds of uh, uh, questions uh, throughout uh, church uh, history as as well. Um, so, uh, and, and it doesn't uh, it doesn't have any uh, address either. So, if we go to to go to the beginning of Hebrews, the opening verses, it doesn't tell us who, who it's from. It doesn't tell us who it's to. Right? It just begins straight away. Uh, into the main body of the letter, right? Long ago, at many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers through uh, through the prophets. Um, and, and for that reason, uh, any attempt for us to uh, work out uh, who the author is and who the audience is, is always, in the end, it's going to be uh, a theory. Uh, it's going to be something that is very difficult to um, to prove. Uh, beyond doubt of course various candidates have been put forward for uh you know who wrote it and who who it was written to and we'll think about those in a moment uh some have better evidence for them some have worse evidence for them uh but uh in the end it's something that's it's going to be difficult uh to to prove but there are some uh, little hints that we have uh at various points in the letter uh the beginning doesn't help us too much but in this case, the ending does help us a little bit. So if we go across to Hebrews 13 and look at how the, how the letter closes, uh, then uh, this, we can read in verse uh, 22. I appeal to you, brothers, bear with my word of exhortation. I've written to you briefly. Uh, it's it's interesting how he calls this brief, isn't it? Because it's it's 13 chapters and it's, and, and it's chucked full. Um, he thinks that this is a brief, uh, brief letter. So um, next time I preach for, you know, 45 minutes or an hour, I can just say thanks for bearing with my brief sermon. 
and <laughs> uh, or I can say thank you for bearing with my brief class this evening, because there's obviously a lot more that could be said. Right? You should know that our brother Timothy has been released, with whom I shall see you if he comes soon. Greet all your leaders and all the saints. Those who come from Italy send you greetings. Grace be with uh, all of you. So you can see from that that the author is, is uh, closely associated with the apostles. Uh, he knows uh, Timothy uh, and the leaders uh, of, of, of this church and so on. Um, so who are the theories of who wrote the book of, of Hebrews? Well, the earliest manuscript of Hebrews that we have uh, suggests it was written by Paul. The, the earliest manuscript is, is the papyrus, P46. And uh, this was the view of a lot in the early church, uh, the Eastern church, that is the Greek speaking church, uh, various Alexandrian uh, scholars. Uh, there's, a, there's a papyrus from the second century that uh, lists the title as the letter of Paul um, to the Hebrews. And various other church fathers uh, were familiar with this, uh, Clement of Alexandria, Tertullian, um, etc. So uh, Clement of Alexandria claimed Paul wrote Hebrews uh, in Hebrew, the Hebrew language, uh, and then Luke translated it into Greek. Uh, and, and, and that's given as an explanation why the, the Greek in uh, Hebrews is so advanced. I mean, if you're learning your learning uh, biblical Greek and Hebrews is not the book that you're going to start with, you're probably going to start with, uh, with John's gospel, I guess, because the Greek of, of Hebrew is... Uh, is uh, it's very advanced and, and it's difficult to, to read. Uh, and so the anonymity is explained by saying that Paul was writing for Hebrews who had a bias against him. Um, the, the, uh, the writer, or uh, the early church father Origen, he also suggested uh, one of Paul's disciples took notes uh, and, and then wrote the material uh, uh, to him. Uh, uh, I mean, wrote the epistle for him, but uh, refused to uh, speculate exactly who that that person was. Uh, so that's a, so there's lots of people over church history who've said Paul wrote it, uh, but many in the Western church, that is the, the Latin church, have doubted that Paul wrote it. So among these, the Moratorium Canon, one of the earliest uh, lists of the biblical books, uh, uh, Irenaeus, uh, Hippolytus of Rome, they all say that Paul definitely wasn't um, the author. Uh, and there was some later Western scholars like Augustine or Jerome, uh, who lived in the fourth century who, or fourth and fifth century, who said that uh, Paul did write it. Um, and, and later on, uh, by the Synod of Carthage, uh, it is ascribed to Paul. Uh, and, and, then it, and, and then Pauline authorship is asserted from that point on uh, in, uh, in, in the Western church. Even some modern Bible translations like uh, the authorized version, the revised version, these use uh, uh, the Pauline title and attribute the letter uh, to, uh, to Paul. So there's lots of people throughout church history who have said uh, Hebrews is written by Paul. But if you read almost any commentary, any scholar in the last 50 years, you're going to find it very, very hard to find anyone um, at all who thinks that uh, that Paul wrote it. And the, the reasons why uh, they doubt that Paul wrote it is, number one, Paul, nearly, Paul basically always identifies himself as the author at the start of his, his letters, and it's not obvious why he wouldn't do that here. Um, Hebrews 2 verse 3 suggests that the author is not himself an apostle. Let's have a look at Hebrews chapter 2 verse 3. He says uh, this, uh, how should we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard, while God also bear witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according uh, to uh, his, his will, right? Uh, so it's uh, yeah, it, that, that suggests that the author himself was not one of the apostles, and it's hard to believe that uh, Paul would identify um, himself as someone who heard the gospel from others rather than hearing it from the Lord Jesus, because, of course, the Lord Jesus appeared to Paul. Um, then there's the subject matter, all the talk about the sacrifices, Jesus is the great high priest, etc. Um, you don't find uh, that in Paul's other letters. Uh, other things like justification by faith, uh, which you do find in the other letters, is not so big here. 
um, it's quite a different style to the other letters. Um, the Greek is 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 quite polished, uh, and uh, the uh, you know Erasmus, who is the great uh, um, you know Greek. Uh, Greek expert, I guess, from the Reformation times, um, says uh, that you know Hebrews is more elegant than Paul's other writings, so it suggests uh, maybe it wasn't written by Paul too. So there's lots of people who think Paul didn't write it. So, if, but if Paul did, didn't write it, then who are your other candidates? Right. So there are a few other candidates that's put forward. Uh, one candidate is Apollos. Um, Martin Luther argued that Apollos was the author of Hebrews because if you read in Acts chapter 18, it tells us that Apollos was an eloquent man. He was he was very uh, confident in the scriptures. He he re vigorously refuted the Jews. Um, he was from Al Al Alexandria, and uh, some people find connections between the book of Hebrews and the writings of Philo of Alexandria, and they say, well, that maybe connects it to po Apollos. He had some uh, missionary contact with Paul as well. Uh, you see that in 1 Corinthians 1 to 4. Um, and, and so many 20th century scholars would argue that Apollos was the author, right? Uh, uh, but again, like other, the other theories, also impossible really to, to prove. Now, then there's a third, uh, third option. Uh, this is Calvin's proposal. Calvin thought that it was written either by Luke or it was written by Clement of Rome, who uh, around 90 to 100 AD. Uh, but uh, the connections between Luke and Hebrews are not that great for that to be a very uh, compelling uh, argument. Uh, Clement is the first person among the early church history people to cite the book of um, Clement, I mean, to cite the book of Hebrews. Now, it wouldn't be totally impossible that someone would cite a book that they themselves wrote, but uh, it's not that normal, is it? I mean, normally you would cite the writings of someone else rather than citing your own uh, your, your, your own works, right? Uh, so, yeah, so uh, Luke or Clement of Rome, those are some other ones. Other people suggest maybe it was uh, Barnabas. Uh, Barnabas is suggested by Tertullian. And he's had various, uh, you know, there's been various supporters recently that have, uh, uh, you know, thought that maybe Barnabas wrote it. Uh, you know, he is, Barnabas has a Levitical background. Um, you see that in Acts 4, 36 and 37. He was also a close partner with the Apostle Paul, went on his missionary journeys together. Uh, uh, Barnabas's name means son of encouragement. And you would have seen when we read at the end of Hebrews there, he's, uh, the author says, you know, I've written a word of exhortation to you or a word of encouragement to you. So, you know, does that fit with uh, Barnabas's name? But again, it's 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 just a speculation. It's it's impossible really to um, to prove. Other people have suggested that uh, Priscilla and Aquila are the author of of Hebrews. They they uh, they they first met in in Corinth in Acts chapter eighteen. They're Jewish refugees uh, from Rome. There's some uh, plurals that are used at various points in the letter, uh, and which is said, or maybe that supports it having two authors instead of uh, instead of one. Um, they they explain the gospel to 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 Apollos in Acts chapter eighteen verse uh, verse uh, twenty six. But uh, this is highly un uh, highly unlikely, I, I I think. And then there's other suggestions as well. Uh, other people suggest Silas or Epaphras or Philip or even Mary. Right? Um, but but none of them is 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 very compelling either. Right? So basically, the conclusion is this: we don't know who wrote um, the book of Hebrews. And uh, Carson, if you've done the readings, he says it's far better to just admit our own ignorance. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so now, because we don't we we don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews. Um, that also leads to some questions about why the book of Hebrews is in the New Testament. Right? Um, of course, the fact that it's anonymous, it doesn't mean that it's it, it can't be God's word. It doesn't mean that it's not authoritative. It doesn't mean that it shouldn't be in the New Testament. Uh, and uh, it, it has been consistently uh, uh, you know, recognized as God's word and authority from, from very early on, right? Uh, in, in the Eastern churches, it's always been accepted as, as, as scripture. 
the Western churches, as we've seen, they they took a little bit longer to uh, you know to to warm up to the idea. Um, in, in the West, it was it was it was excluded from some of the the earliest lists of the New Testament uh, books, but eventually it, it received universal acceptance into the into the canon. And I guess the issue uh, is is kind of this, right? Um, a lot of the books in the New Testament. The reason, one of the reasons why that they're in the New Testament and um, they're they're recognised as authoritative is basically because they're written by the apostles or they're written by someone closely associated with the apostles. So Matthew's an apostle. Uh, Mark, we've seen, is closely associated with uh, with Peter and also travels with Paul on his missionary journeys. Uh, Luke, of course, also travelled with uh, with with Paul. John was an apostle. Uh, uh, Paul, of course, was an apostle. Jesus appeared to him on the Damascus uh, Damascus Road. James, uh, Jesus half uh, Jesus half brother. Um, uh, Jude, another one of his half brothers, and 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 so on. So they've all got some some connection uh, to the apostles, a close connection to the apostles. Either they're written by the apostles, or they're written on behalf of the apostles, or with the eyewitness accounts of the apostles. They're somehow closely associated with uh, with the apostles, and that's how they got into the to the New Testament, so not not quite knowing where did the Book of Hebrews originate from, um, led some in uh, the early church to wonder, well, why? How did it find its way into the New Testament? But of course, uh, maybe those those last uh, few verses that we read, showing that he definitely knows who Timothy is, he definitely knows the leaders of the church, and so on. It does show whoever this person is, they are associated with at least Paul's apostolic band. Um, now, uh, he's clearly someone who's respected for this letter to have been preserved uh, and, and, and kept. Uh, so those are some of the issues, and you can do your readings if you're interested to find out more about that. So the next issue, then, is who is it written to, right? So I don't know who it's written by, uh, and uh, we're not also really sure who it's written to, right? Uh, so the title of the book is... Uh, for the Hebrews, or or to the Hebrews, um, uh, it's not quite sure whether that's the original title of the book because it it, it first appears in a papyrus that is a, a from about AD two hundred, so not necessarily in the early ones, uh, and it's not you that that title is not used by earlier uh, writers. So it may it may just be that you know when it when the letter found its way into the canon, into the New Testament canon, that uh, the title was given to kind of match with the other titles, like, you know, uh, uh, letter to the Romans, letter to the Corinthians. So this one just, it, it somehow got the title uh, to the to the Hebrews, but it maybe was not an original title uh, uh, to the book, right? Uh, the writer, though, he clearly assumes a an, an audience of Hebrew Christians, that is, Jewish Christians. I mean, that if you look at the contents of the letter with all the, uh, you know, with all the priests and all the sacrifices and all the Old Testament allusions and Moses and so on, there's so many of that stuff. It just makes sense that it's it's written to a, a Jewish audience, and that's the view of uh, most uh, most scholars um, that you that you read. But that's still a rather generic thing, isn't it? Okay, it was written to Jewish Christians, but which Jewish Christians? What was their situation? Now, again, it's it's hard to be uh, much more specific um, uh, than that. Uh, uh, Acts chapter 6, verse 1, distinguishes between Hebrew-speaking Christians, Hebrews, uh, and Hellenistic Jews, that's Greek-speaking uh, Jews. But whether that kind of division is reflected here, uh, it's kind of hard to tell because, the, as I said, the Greek is so advanced, right? So it's clearly written to people who must have pretty good uh, Greek, right? So Carson says the most that we can reasonably that can reasonably be said is that the Jewish background of the readers was probably not so much in the conservative rabbinic traditions of Palestine as in Hellenistic Judaism, influenced by various uh, non-conformist Jewish sects. Of which the Essenes are but one example, right? So basically, the let the letter is written for Greek-speaking Jewish Christians. That seems to be uh, something that we could be reasonably uh, confident 
uh, about. Right? Uh, and uh, since the author refers to the experiences of his uh, readers, uh, he seems to be writing to a specific group of people that he knows personally. So not just like a, you know, writing some general letter that he sent out to anyone and everyone. It seems like the author has a specific group of, of people in mind, right? So if we have a look at chapter 10 and verse 32, uh, then we see that. He says, recall the former days when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being uh, publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, sometimes being partners with those so treated, you had compassion on those in prison, you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you, you, you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one, right? So he seems to know um, these people. Um, he seems to know what their, um, their situation uh, has, has been, right? Okay, now, uh, you know, uh, where were these people living? Uh, various examples have been uh, proposed, uh, but the only one that really has any support for it uh, is, is, is Rome. Uh, and uh, you see that from the final greeting in, in chapter 13. Let's go back there again, chapter 13 and verse 24. It says, uh, greet all your leaders and all the saints, those who come from Italy send you uh, greetings. Uh, so this would suggest that they were writing uh, back from Rome, right? Um, they're in Italy, they're in Rome, and 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 and, and they're sending it. Um, and, and and perhaps that explains why you know the Greek is is, is so polished and so on. But anything beyond that is is really a guess, and you could probably speculate uh, anything. So, uh, so we don't know who the author is. We're not really sure who the audience is, although it's probably Jewish Christians who spoke good Greek. Um, and it was probably written from Rome um, to, to the people. Uh, but, okay, the next, uh, the next question is uh, the provenance and the dating. So you can imagine if you're not sure who it's from and who it's to, then it's also quite difficult to date it and uh, to know where it was, where it was written from. So we, we looked at just now, those from Italy send you greetings, uh, but it's unclear whether these people were originally from, from Italy and sending greetings to Italy, or whether the author is in Italy and he's sending greetings to the recipients in another place. It's, you know, you think that phrase helps you, but it doesn't actually help you um, uh, that much, right? The fact that he's not an apostle suggests that the date's not that early, probably after 50 AD, right? The fact that Hebrews 1 is quoted by Clement of Rome in AD 96 suggests that that's kind of the outer limit of where it, it, it could have been written. Uh, of course, it had to be written in the lifetime of Timothy as well, since he's mentioned as one of the people in, in the letter. Uh, and Timothy joined Paul's missionary journeys around AD 49. Um, so it's, I mean, those are those are the outer limits. It's somewhere between AD 49 and somewhere between AD 96. So we can be at least confident, be confident of uh, of, of that much. Uh, it does talk quite a lot about uh, about persecution. Hebrews 12 says, uh, in, in your struggle against sin, you've not yet resisted to the point of death or shedding your blood. Uh, so maybe that locates it sometime around the persecution of Nero. Remember, Nero was going around killing all the Christians around 64 uh, AD. So that might be a good guess. Uh, the fact that he's still talking about the temple and sacrifices and so on, perhaps that suggests that the temple hasn't been destroyed yet. I think that would be a reasonable conclusion as well. Um, you'd think that uh, the author would probably have mentioned that if it had already happened since you know he it's those things are such a big uh, topic in the letter uh so it would su seem to suggest maybe it's written before ad 70 so the cousin's conclusion is although one cannot de uh, decisively rule out any date between ad 60 and 100 uh the most evidence favors a date before ad 70 right. okay uh 
the next question we 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 would be on to is uh, to think about the purpose of the letter. But actually, before we talk about the purpose of uh, Hebrews, it's actually good to think about what the genre is. Right? What kind of writing is this? Right? That's what we mean by genre. Genre we usually mean like, uh, you know, is it laws, poetry, letter, apocalyptic, etc. Right? Um, there are different styles of writing. So. Uh, what kind of a writing uh, is this? I mean, it's it, it's a little bit different to other ones, right? As we said, normally when you're writing a letter, like Paul's letters, you say who you know uh, who who it's from, and you say who it's to, and um, these kinds of things. But this, you, you know, this uh, letter clearly doesn't uh, doesn't do that, right? So there have been few proposals that have been put forward here. The first proposal that People say, well, maybe this is a theological treatise, right? Since it's so uh, impersonal, since he's not really addressing, uh, he doesn't identify who his recipients are, um, and because it's got such a sustained kind of reflection on Jesus' priesthood and sacrifices, then maybe it's a theological treatise. Um, but that's probably unlikely, right? Yes, it does have some pretty rich uh, theology in it. No one's doubting that. Um, but if it was just a theological treatise, then it wouldn't make sense why he's got all the warning passages. Is it warning warning them about falling away? It, you have warning passages in when you're you have some kind of pastoral purpose, isn't it? When you're 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 concerned with the specific people that you're talking about. Theological treatise is probably quite general, and you. You, 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 it's like writing a book or something and you just post it out for anyone and everyone uh, to to read. So the warning passages suggest it's not just a theological treatise. Uh, and uh, of course, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't end that way either. Uh, so if you have a look at how it ends, uh, then that, that maybe helps us a little bit as well. Uh, it's... It does end like a letter does. It doesn't begin like a letter does, but it does end like a letter does, right? With the final greetings, right? Um, you, you know, he said he talks about Timothy. He says, "Greet all your leaders. Um, you know, grace be with you all." That that actually is quite similar um, to how a lot of Paul's letters uh, end, right? So it's probably not a theological treatise, although it's got rich theology. Second option. Is it an epistle, right? What's an epistle? Epistle is a, a letter that's written to a church that's meant to be read by the church, right? Uh, by uh, as a as a as a gathered uh, group, uh, and you know it does have the final greetings, which are kind of letter-like. Yeah, does that justify calling the whole thing a epistle? Well, uh, to some extent, yes, but. But probably not fully, because it's such it's, it's got such a uh, a complex and rich structure to it, as we'll see in a moment. Uh, it doesn't quite fit with how you might normally write a letter. So there's a third uh, option that's put forward, and this is probably the best way of thinking about it, um, and that is uh, to categorize Hebrews according to how it describes itself. Right. Uh, so if we go back to Hebrews 13 again. Uh, he says, I appeal to you, brothers, bear with my word of exhortation. Okay. Um, what's a word of exhortation? Well, it's, it, it's something like a sermon, right? Uh, or what we, in you know, previous times might have called a, a homily, right? Um, perhaps there was some scripture readings. You know, there's some passages that uh, recur. Um, in in uh, this letter, like, uh, uh, for example, Psalm 110 or Psalm 95, he quotes those passages quite a lot of times in the book of Hebrews. So, uh, yeah, maybe there's been some Bible readings, and now this is something like a, you know, a written written sermon um, uh, that has been, been sent to them, right? Uh, so, that is maybe the best way of, of, of categorizing it. Something like a, like a letter, something like a theological treatise, but in the end, it's it's probably best seen more more like a sermon than anything else. A very rich sermon, fairly well well structured sermon, um, a very theological sermon, but uh, 
but but uh, but designed to those uh, to those ends. Uh, so that that brings us then to the purpose, right? Um, that surely is what the purpose of the letter is then. That's what he says at the end, isn't it? Bear with my word of exhortation. Why is he writing the letter? He wants to exhort them. He wants to encourage them. He wants to help them to keep on following Jesus and not give up. We might summarize the, the, the purpose of the letter in, uh, in, this, in this way. Let me share uh, on the screen. So it's easy to follow. So we might summarize the purpose like this: to exhort the hearers to endure in the to endure in their pursuit of the promised reward in obedience to the word of God, and especially on the basis of their new covenant relationship with the Son. Right? Uh, to exhort the hearers to endure. Right? Looking forward to the hope of heaven, that is, and to be obedient to God's words, especially because they are now in a new covenant relationship with God. Of course, that's a, a, so much of the so much of the letter is is taken up with showing how Jesus fulfills and then makes obsolete the Old Testament worship system, right? The Old Testament worship system had its priests, it had, it had sacrifices, it had its tabernacle and uh, all these uh, various rituals and so on, right? Um, it had, its, it had its promises and it had its co old covenant and all this. And the point of Hebrews, which he makes at, at great length, is that Jesus has fulfilled all of those things. You know, Jesus is the greater Moses. Um, Jesus is the... Uh, uh, is the perfect priest. Jesus is the, the one who's offered the, the perfect sacrifice um, once for all. Uh, Jesus is the one who has made, you know, opened the way uh, to go into the true tabernacle. That is not, uh, you know, not, not some earthly tent, but to, he's opened the way for us to go into heaven itself, uh, into, in, into the very presence of God. There's a lot that is kind of taken up with showing how Jesus fulfills all of those things and and not just that he fulfills all, all of those things but uh by fulfilling them he actually makes all those things uh obsolete right so one way of uh one way of us we see that is in hebrews chapter 8 and verse 13 he says in speaking of a new covenant he makes the first one obsolete what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away, right? So it's not just that he's saying that uh, Jesus fulfills all the Old Testament, but but as he fulfills the Old Testament, it means that those things no longer apply anymore. Right? Uh, we no longer need you know physical priests and to, to be offering animal sacrifices and going to the temple and, uh, and and all of those things. He's saying, look, because Jesus has fulfilled all of that in bringing in the new covenant, we don't need um, any of those things anymore and I think that starts to help us to see what's going on in terms of uh, the purpose it, it seems to be the case he's running to Jewish Christians remember uh, Jewish Christians who are, we'll see in a moment, who are suffering and it seems to be that the temptation for the readers of this epistle is that they are being tempted to go back to Judaism um, they're suffering as Jewish Christians and so they're being tempted to give up on Jesus and go back to being Jews. Right? And so what the author is exhorting them, urging them, trying to convince them to do is not to give up on Jesus, not to fall away from Christ, not to go back to Judaism, because to do that, well, that would be to, to, you know, to lose your salvation, to come under the judgment of God. You know, all those scary warning passages, that, 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 that's where they start to... Uh, to fit in uh, and we start to see that as we we read the letter remember uh, uh, historical context is, is is often very valuable in in working out why a letter is written and therefore so we read it correctly um, but of course very often the only way we can know what the historical context was is by reading the letter itself and so as we read through Hebrews we think well based on what he's saying to them what seems to be their their situation and at some point some passages 
uh, it, it starts to uh, become uh, clearer to us. Uh, so one passage we could look at here is chapter 10 and verse uh, 32. Let me put it up on the screen. Chapter 10, verse 32. He says, but recall the former days when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with suffering, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, sometimes being partners with those so treated you had compassion on those in prison. You joyfully accepted the plundering of your property since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Therefore, do not throw away your great confidence, which has a great reward. You have need of endurance so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. So uh, do you see how that kind of hints to us what, what's, what's going on here? Um, at least in the past, they faced some severe persecution. I mean, they, 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 their property has been um, been taken. There's been people going to prison and and, and, and so on. They they faced some pretty uh, severe persecution. And now the temptation is uh, that it says that th therefore don't throw away your confidence. That is. Don't give up on your faith. Don't, don't, don't stop following Jesus now. So, so look, you've gone through so much in the past, so why give up on him now when you've, you've gone through such harder things uh, uh, before, right? Uh, and it seems to be yeah, that, th that this, uh, this persecution may have been the reason why they want to give up on their Christian faith and go back to uh, Judaism. This is also somewhat suggested at the end of uh, of. Uh, of Hebrews as well, if we came to chapter 13 and verse 7, Hebrews 13 and verse 7, uh, uh, he writes, remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word uh, of God, consider the outcome of their way of life, imitate their faith, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever, do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods which have not benefited those devoted to them. We have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach that he uh, endured. Right? So uh, you can see that uh, Jesus, I mean, Jesus is being presented there as the, you know, the ultimate uh, sacrifice for sin, you know, the burnt offering after you offer sacrifice, it was taken outside the camp and burned it. So Jesus is being uh, presented as that, you know, that perfect uh, burnt offering, that perfect uh, sacrifice uh, uh, sacrifice for sin. And, and he's saying to them, look, go out to Jesus outside the camp. Yeah. Um, because we have an altar that those who serve the tent, that is, you, you know, serve the, the temple, the tabernacle, Judaism, uh, have no right to eat. So that, that seems to hint to us, isn't it? That, uh, there's something going on here with them being tempted to go back to their old uh, Jewish way of life. And so quite a number of times he talks about maintaining their confession. He talks about not falling away. Um, and the way he's going to achieve all this, basically, is to show how superior Jesus is. Right? Uh, lots of people, when they talk about Hebrews, they, so, they, they point out how Jesus is better, right? He's better, you know, he's more superior than the angels. His name is superior to the angels. He's a better, Mo he's, he's greater than Moses. He's, he's a greater high priest. He's a greater sacrifice. He's gone into the, uh, into the greater tent. It's, 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 a, it's a better covenant, the new covenant. It's, it's got better promises, more secure promises for the future, etc. So the point is this, is, you know, look how amazing Jesus is. Look how the how great the gospel is. Why would you want to leave Jesus and all that you have in Jesus to go back to something else, actually something else that's being abolished, it's obsolete, and it's not going to help you? Yeah. Um, that, that, that's the kind of the flavor 
of the argument here. Um, they're suffering. There's a temptation to go back to Judaism, and he wants them to persevere. And so he's exhorting them. He's urging them. He's encouraging them. Don't give up on Jesus. See how great Jesus is. And hence the great uh, theological reflection about the greatness of Jesus. And hence the scary warning passages about what happens if they give up um, on, on Jesus. Well, let's keep going then. And uh, the next topic for us to think about is the structure. And what we want to realize at this point is that basically the book of Hebrews is a literary masterpiece. Right? It is uh, it is one of the most carefully um, constructed and well-written um, books in the whole of the over the New Testament. Right? Um, it has it has various structures within structures and overlapping arguments, and it's 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 so rich in 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 so many ways. Um, and and because it's so rich and it's so complex in its structure. That means that there's uh, often been uh, disagreements about what is the best way to structure it. And there's even been different approaches of how to structure it. So let's, let's look at a couple of these and then uh, maybe we'll have a look at a um, perhaps best suggestion. So one way people try to structure it is basically based on the themes you know, or the main topics, if you like. Um, so the finality of uh, Christianity, um, you know, we're living in the last days. God's perfectly revealed himself through his son. Uh, the true home of the people of God. So we're looking forward to rest in a new creation, the high priesthood of Christ, the order of Melchizedek, um, covenant sanctuary sacrifice, call to worship, faith, and perseverance, uh, and exhortation, uh, final exhortation and prayer. So it's, it's basically just trying to look at the themes or look at the content and on the basis of that come up with, uh, with a structure. So that's one way of looking at it. Uh, and as I said, that's probably helpful in summarizing the contents, but not necessarily the flow of the argument or how it's put together. Uh, so uh, the, the second the second option here is trying to uh, look at the book with in terms of all the uh, rhetorical devices that's in it. I think this heading is wrong here. Sorry about that. Uh, but yeah, you're looking at things like, okay, is there inclusios? What's an inclusio? Um, inclusio is like a bookend, right? You've got something at the beginning and you've got something that kind of matches it at the end. It's not necessarily a chiasm, you know, a chiasm, you've got two different bits with, you know, with a third thing in the, in the middle, like A, B, B, A, that would be a chiasm, right? Um, uh, inclusio is not saying anything about what's in the middle. It's just saying that you've got the bookends is, is similar, right? So you can look for uh, inclusios, uh, you know, rhetorical questions sometimes can uh, show where you're up to in the argument, uh, repetitions. Uh, and sometimes people also examine the book in terms of the various, uh, you know, rhetorical approaches. Um, and we've talked about this a few times in the course that, uh, you know, there were, there were these different uh, rhetorical styles. Remember, rhetoric is the art of persuasion. And there were various uh, uh, different ways that people tried to persuade and they were written into these handbooks that you could learn and you could study study rhetoric so that you could learn uh, how to uh, persuade someone uh, and uh, it doesn't matter if you don't know what these are you know judicial uh, deliberative epideictic these are the different you know different types of, of of rhetoric right so some people have tried to kind of map the book onto these uh, um, rhetorical styles and and to, and to structure it in in that way um, but it's a little bit hard to do that because uh, the book seems to use more than one style, right? So on the one hand, uh, it will have, uh, uh, you know, it, it's got this uh, rich theology. Jesus is the greatest sacrifice. He's the better, better priest and, and all this kind of teaching, uh, teaching style. But then you've got the warning passages style, the, the exhortations, the, um, you know, the warnings don't, don't fall away from Jesus. And they're, they're quite different. And as we'll see in a moment, the book just switches between them uh, very quickly. Exhortation, I mean, uh, exposition, exhortation, exposition, exhortation. It just jumps between the two. So saying it's only one rhetorical style, this just doesn't, doesn't, doesn't really work, right? Uh, so then you can look at uh, various uh, literary, uh, literary analysis. Uh, you can look for, you know, statements that introduce new topics, 
um, the inclusios, the, you can look for the alternation between exposition and exhortation, uh, repetition of terms, um, hook words, various various things like uh, like that. Um, and that can be helpful, although you know some people say, oh, the whole book is a chiasm, that probably doesn't work. Uh, people talk about discourse analysis. Um, so here, a, a discourse analysis is where you're trying to understand the, ver the relationships between the various sections and how one part leads to the uh, leads to the next and so on. Um, and so, uh, you know, you, for example, you might look look for certain keywords that are repeated, like let us do this. Uh, maybe, maybe that identifies something. Uh, but the, the main thing to uh, the main thing that, that is really helpful about this approach is just recognizing the idea of exposition and exhortation, teaching, and then uh, you know application. I guess if you if, if if you want to put it that way, and and uh, it's noticed how the book alternates between these these two, right? So here here would be some of the you know, exposition passages, he's superior to the angels, so his incarnation, his priesthood, his sacrifice. Um, and then there, there are these various uh, exhortation sections that, uh, uh, that, that, that come through too, um, which would suggest that the, the, the book has, uh, the book is structured. Uh, you have to take account of it moving between these, these, these two different styles. Yeah? So, in the end, you've got to try and put all these different approaches together, right? So obviously the book is going to be structured. It's going to be something to do with the, the, the contents of it, themes, right? Uh, it's going to be something to do with, well, well usually when you're writing so, an argument, you indicate somehow that this part of the argument's ending and this part of the argument's beginning. So you're looking at the, you know, the lit literary features of it, um, the repetitions, all that, that's going to help you. And then, yeah, maybe you're looking at the discourse, we jump between exhortation and exposition. So you look at all these things together. Okay, then maybe you can come up with a, a rather complex uh, structure to it. So let me put up a couple of these and then uh, you, you'll get some ideas of where people go with it, right? Uh, so an introduction, something like a prologue, uh, one to four. Uh, and then uh, you have uh, first main section, one chapters one to four. The main body for fourteen to twenty five. You're going to be hard pressed to find anyone who disagrees with this being the main body of the book. I mean, nearly everyone recognizes four fourteen to ten twenty five as the main, you know, you know, really the main section of uh, of, of the book. Uh, you've got an exhortation section, a longer exhortation section towards the end, chapters ten to thirteen, and then the final conclusions, as we've seen, the greetings and. Uh, and, and and all of that. Uh, so uh, you have these major turning points at 414 to 16 and 10, 19 to 25. Uh, and so if you, you, you notice those two things, then the bit in the middle, chapter five to, to 10, is kind of the main, the meat, if you like, or the main, uh, the main part of, uh, of, uh, of the, you know, epistle or letter, whatever you're going to call it. Uh, uh, all to do with Jesus' sacrifice and Jesus, uh, Jesus' priesthood. Right? So let's have a look at another another example here. Uh, and this is from uh, from Westfall. So you, again, in similar sections, you've got one, uh, one to four. You have got four to ten. Notice how this overlaps here uh, because it's seen as kind of a tran transitionary passage. It wraps up one part and also looks forward to the end. Uh, same thing happening here, where the end here overlaps with here. Uh, and so the first part, consider Jesus the apostle of our confession. The main part, consider Jesus the high priest of our confession. Uh, and then the last part, we're partners in Jesus' heavenly, uh, heavenly calling. There's lots about these two structures that's actually very similar um, when you look at it. The other thing I didn't point out in this one, notice the, the movement between exposition and exhortation. Yeah. Exposition, exhortation. Yeah. Um, and then uh, exposition and then a long, you know, a longer, uh, a longer exhortation. Yeah. Now maybe it's worth us just having a look at a couple of these so you, you kind of 
know what I mean when we're talking about exposition and and, and exhortation. Okay, so uh, let's start with the first one uh, with chapters uh, one, uh, one and two, Hebrews one and two. Share my screen. Okay, you see that? Okay, so we've got the we've got the prologue here, verses uh, uh, verses one to four, um, and then uh, it, it's in and the prologue ends by saying that Jesus is superior to the angels. He's much more superior to the angels, as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. This is, you know, this is one of those statements where it's kind of wrapping up the first, you know, it's wrapping up the prologue, verses one to four, but it's also indicating what's going to be the topic of the verses that follow it, right? Um, so now he's going to argue how Jesus is superior to the angels. And there's a lot of quotations here. Uh, to which of the angels did God ever say this? Right? Um, but look at what he says of the son and look how this is so much uh, greater, what he says of Jesus as the son. Jesus is superior uh, to the angels. Right? Uh, and, but then notice how he, 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 he straight away, he drops into exhortation. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we've heard, lest we drift from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? Yeah. Like any good sermon, right? he moves from exposition to application. Here's the truth. Jesus is, better, is, is superior to the angels, you know. Um, so what's the application? Pay closer attention. Don't drift away from Jesus. If Jesus is greater than the angels, don't drift away from Jesus. It will have, uh, it will have big consequences to it. Mm -hmm. uh, let's look at another example. I think chapter 5 was one of the other examples that was listed there. So let's look at that. Ch Hebrews chapter 5. Okay, and, and here you can see it's talking about the high priest. Every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men, in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward, etc. Right? So Christ doesn't exalt himself to be made a high priest. He's appointed by him who said, this is Psalm 2, this is Psalm 110, and, and various things. Right? So it's got some teaching, some teaching about Jesus and his, his priesthood and how he was appointed as high priest. And then notice the switch to exhortation in verse 11. About this, we have much to say. And it's hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. Okay. Uh, so let, let's, let's look at one more example of the, uh, this alternation between the exposition and the exhortation and this comes at the end of that that main section remember that main theological section from chapters five to ten right so right at the end of that he's kind of summarizes everything that he's um, really said in chapters five to ten and then it, it, it comes to a a warning passage after that um, in, in fact the one that I, we began with this evening so if we come across chapter 10 Okay, uh, and we'll look at verses 19 to 25 here. So this is, a, this is really the summary, chapters 5 to 10. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened us for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast our confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Right. So you've got all this... Uh, exposition jesus the great high priest jesus the great sacrifice jesus going into the heavenly uh, heavenly tabernacle etc 
Uh, and then this is at the end, right? Let us, let us, let us, right? You see it here, verse 22. Let us draw near. Uh, verse 23, let us hold fast. Let us, verse 24, let us consider um, our, yeah, how to stir up one another and let us not neglect uh, meeting together and then straight into the negative warning passages, right? For if we go on sinning deliberately, etc., cetera, um, you know, there's no longer any sacrifice for sin and there, there'll be a worse punishment you profane the blood of the covenant. You've outraged the spirit of grace. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of, of, of the mighty God. Right? So you can see how it very much moves between this positive exposition. You know, this is who Jesus is, right? Uh, and therefore, this is what we should do. Let us. And then exhortation, warning, don't do this. Um, don't fall away. This is what will happen um, to you. And you may have, you, uh, we may have talked about inclusios, right, and bookends of things. So you notice the, the various let us statements there and descriptions of Jesus' priesthood. Um, and that, that's how the section begins as well. If we were to look at Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 14. Uh, let me share the Bible. Chapter 4 and verse 14. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. Notice the let us again there. Uh, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy, find grace to help in time of need. And uh, well, this phrase here, is, uh, let us draw near, um, that's very similar to what we just read in chapter 10, isn't it? Uh, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of, of, of faith. So, I mean, that, that that shows you already, isn't it? It's 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 highly structured. It's very deliberate. Uh, at least you have this main section, Jesus the high priest, Jesus the perfect sacrifice, bookended with these various let us statements. But even as he, he goes through that main section, the warning passages. Right? Um, here's how Jesus is greater. Don't fall away. Here's how Jesus is greater. Don't fall away. Here's what will happen if you fall away, um, etc. Et, et uh, and so you've got to account for both of these as you think about the purpose. Right? Um, how are they related? Why does it have the positive, Jesus is greater, and the negative? don't fall away well obviously they get, they're serving the same purpose aren't they right. um, how do you stop someone from falling away from jesus well on the one hand you've got to warn them of the consequences if they do right and on the other hand you've got to tell them why they should stick with him like why, why why is he so great in in the first place so with both the positive and the negative yeah he, he's exhorting them to keep following uh following jesus uh, this also helps you as well you know where if you see someone who's uh, uh you, you know they seem like they're drifting from jesus a bit they seem like they're you know they're not that committed or, or whatever um there's a twofold approach isn't it um on the one hand they need to know why jesus is better why is jesus worth sticking to tell them how wonderful jesus is help them to appreciate how wonderful he is but then also help them to understand what's the consequences if they if they do leave. Both of those things uh, uh, will, will motivate them hopefully to stick um, to stick with Jesus. Now, how does this uh, you know fit into the uh, uh, you know the Calvinist Calvinist question and all that, right? Because we're talking, you know, is it you know is it once saved always saved? Um, you know, that's kind of a pithy way that sometimes people summarize Calvinism. Yeah. Um, Calvinism, God's sovereignty in, uh, emphasizes God's sovereignty in salvation and uh, talks about how it, it, sometimes we you remember it by Tulip. Have you heard of Tulip before? Uh, you know, total uh, depravity, uh, unconditional election, limited atonement, uh, irresistible grace, and then the P perseverance of the saints this is the issue for this one wesley uh charles wesley who was the main proponent of arminianism um he is uh 
the book of Hebrews and he wrote extensively on the book of Hebrews to argue for his Armenian position, saying, look, uh, it's up to free will, our free will, we can choose to follow Jesus, our free will, we can give up on Jesus. And, and hence, well, why, why have uh, warning passages? Because you can give up on Jesus. Can't be once saved, always saved, must be the possibility of falling away. So you must be in, so Arminianism must be right, not Calvinism. That's, I mean, that's a very uh, rough way of uh, summarizing, you, you know, Wesley. He was a, he was a fantastic, fantastic writer and really could argue his case, right? He had nuanced arguments, right? But put it very simply, you know, that's, that's the kind of argument he'd make here from, uh, from Hebrews, right? Whereas a Calvinist, uh, drawing from, from other passages as well, would say, well, look, uh, there's lots of passages that emphasize that uh, God perseveres um, people. He, he keeps them trusting in Jesus um, to the end. We've seen some of those, like in Romans, uh, the golden chain, Romans 8, or at the beginning of Philippians, God who began a good work in you will bring it to completion on the day of Christ Jesus. We've read some of these passages in the other uh, in, in the other courses. So how do you, if you're a Calvinist, how do you make sense of the warning passages? Right? Well, of course, they have to be real warnings. Otherwise, what's the point of writing it, right? So there has to be a possibility of falling away. Otherwise, the warnings are meaningless, right? Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that there are uh, going to be an actuality for God's chosen um, elect. And you imagine uh, sometimes people use this illustration. You're on the side of a cliff, right? And the side of a cliff, um, there is uh, a fence um, and there is some signs that are put up that said, uh, you know, beware, cliff, fall over the cliff and you're not coming back. Right. So are they, is it, is it a real danger? You know, of course it's a real danger. If you, you, you go over the cliff, then, uh, you know, you, you're, you're going to die, right? You, you're going to fall to your death and you're not coming back. Yeah. But does that mean, but the fact that that's a real possibility, does that, I mean, that there's a real danger, does that mean that that's what's going to happen? Because, of course, the whole point of having the fence, uh, of having the signs, of having, uh, you know, your, your friend over on the edge saying, oh, you're getting very close to the edge, you better be careful, you're going to fall off and you're going to die, right? The whole point is that through the, the warnings, uh, as well as through the, the positive teaching, that it's going to stop you. Um, from, from falling away. So that's how the that's how the Calvinists would think about this, right? It's it's not that there's no possibility or no danger. There is real danger, but God, in His sovereignty, will keep His chosen people um, trusting Him, right? And uh, and one of the ways He will keep His chosen people trusting Him and not falling away is through these warning passages. And is that is God's elect, God's chosen people will hear the exposition they will hear the exhortations and they will listen to them and and therefore they won't um they won't fall away and and that seems to be the case uh, what what the author expects of his readers here right so he has these very scary uh, warning passages but then he, he doesn't expect that they're going to eventuate for his readers so we just read uh, chapter 10 here uh which is probably one of the scariest things it's you know it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of uh, uh of the living god etc et uh he says don't uh, don't don't uh, don't throw away your confidence right you have need of endurance and, and all of that but notice how he ends here in verse 39 but we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed but of those who have faith and preserve their souls right so in other words even though he's really deliberately trying to scare the living daylights out of them <laughs> by writing this stuff um he is actually expecting that they're going to listen to the warnings they're not really going to turn their back on jesus they are going to stick with him they are going to listen to um to 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 what he's he's, he's going to say and um, the other the other answer that the, the calvinists would give us in looking at this uh the book of hebrews is uh, so what, what happens when you do meet someone who has fallen away? Because I'm sure we all know people who were in church once. Maybe you you went to youth group together or something, and and they're not they're not in church now. I know people like that. One of the key people who brought me along to church and um, and 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 so on, as far as I know, is no longer walking 
uh, with with the law. They they made a fairly stark and deliberate decision to, you know, to leave Jesus and Christianity. I hope they've come back, but as far as I know, to this day they they haven't haven't yet. So what uh, you, you know what? How do you make sense of that? You know this. This person grew up in church. They were very committed. They were serving on their Christian fellowship committee. You know, I've got various emails and uh, you know and, and messages saying how much this person you know loved loved God and how important it was to share the gospel with others. So how do you make sense of that? You know, here's this person who is very committed, but now they're no longer with uh, you know with with Jesus. If it's really once saved, always saved, then how do you how do you make sense of that? Uh, and I. Even here, I think the book of Hebrews does uh, does help us, right? Uh, so let's have a look at, I think it's, it's chapter 3 uh, and, uh, and verse 6. Uh, this is what it says, uh, verse, chapter 3, verse 6. Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house if indeed... We hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. You have to look at that very carefully. How do you know that you are God's house, you are one of God's people, part of his true temple, etc.? How do you know? You persevere, right? So therefore, if you are one of God's elect people, his chosen people, then the way that you'll know that is that you'll you'll keep trusting him to the end, right? And so, if you don't trust him to the end, then what does that mean? You weren't one of his house. You weren't. You you were never one of his people. You mean you may have mixed with God's people. You may have hung out with Christians, etc. But we we all know that when people come to church, they're a mixed group, isn't it? And when uh, you know 50 or 100 people 200 people turn up to your church on sunday um they could have all, all kinds of things isn't it and and we can't peer into their hearts and really know what they're like i mean we can test something we can know something based on the fruit of their lives and what they say and um and, and how frequent they attend and so on we can we can kind of guess of where they're they're at with the lord but the reality is that people have there's a whole spectrum of different people. Maybe there are some nominal people, that, or there's people there because their parents force them to be there. Maybe there's some who are committed. Maybe there are others there that are not yet Christians. They're investigating the Christian faith. There's a whole group of people that are, are turning up to uh, to the church on Sunday, right? And if you're writing a letter like the writer to the Hebrews is here, well, you don't know, you know, which one is which, isn't it? You just address everyone. Yeah. Um, and those who are truly God's people are going to listen to what you say, and those who are not truly God's people are not going to listen to what you have to say. And, and so in the end, you'll know in the long term whether someone was one of God's elect or not. This is one way the, the, the Calvinists would, would uh, address this. So, uh, so you can see how, you can see why Wesley would argue for Arminianism from Hebrews, but, but actually I think as we, as we think more about uh, the warning passages and their function and so on. Um, there's no there's no reason uh, to uh, to say okay, no Calvinism doesn't doesn't work. You know? um, it's it's sometimes it, it, it can be dangerous when you just have the catchphrase once saved always saved. You think well, how does that fit with a warning passage? Right? But those those people who argue for these positions, whether it's Wesley for Arminianism or it's Calvin for Calvinism. They're not advancing simplistic arguments. You know, maybe we, we we're told a simplistic argument, but uh, they're actually much more detailed, um, and they thought about it a lot more in terms of their exegesis. So we need to actually think about the full argument and not just the little catchphrase, maybe that we've, uh, we've heard. Okay, so yeah, I think you know we've just looked at uh, Hebrews chapter eight, verse one to thirteen, and it, it is a good passage to give you a flavor for the book, isn't it? Um, you can see again and again there how he's 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 comparing Jesus, uh, you know, his priesthood, his uh, new covenant, etc., to um, to the Old Testament times, and showing how Jesus is is better, how Jesus is yeah is superior. You see that language coming up many times, isn't it? Uh, of how he is uh, how he is he's better, right? He's obtained. A ministry that is more excellent. The covenant he mediates is better. It's enacted on 
better promises and, and, and so on. He's saying again and again, Jesus is better. Jesus is superior. What Jesus is doing is far more excellent. And it's, uh, it's quite detailed in, in the comparison. You know, he's saying, oh, the Old, the Old Testament priests, they, of course, they went into a tent. They went into the tabernacle to offer their sacrifices. But Jesus is going into the to the true tent. And this language of, uh, you know, the, or the, the true tent, it's, it's talking about the, uh, you know, the fulfillment or what, um, you know what what the old testament model was all uh, pointing forward to there was what's the true tent well the true tent is uh, the tent that was that the lord set up not man and that is it's talking about heaven right um tabernacle symbolizes god's presence but god doesn't live in a tent you, you know god, god dwells in heaven itself that, that's where jesus goes he dies on the cross he's raised again and he goes into the true tent into heaven um uh, heaven itself right talks about they serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things now you can imagine it like this i mean if there was a you know when they're building a new condo somewhere um, usually in some shopping mall they make up one of those you know those miniature little models of uh of the uh, of the condo of the new condo and you can see you know how tall it is and you know where the swimming pool is going to be where the car park is going to be where the dark course is going to be and you know all the various features of, uh, of of the condo and then someone hand you a flyer and say oh you know look how wonderful this uh, this condo is you should you you should buy it you should buy one of the units here right so you have uh but, but all they're showing you is the you know it's the copy it's the model it's the shadow it's not the real thing you, you know you don't think okay i'm gonna pay my you know uh, however many hundred thousand to get a piece of the the cardboard you know the cardboard model that they put on display right the cardboard model is pointing forward to the to the real thing you know the actual condo that they're that they're building uh, and that you're one day going to move in uh, move into it um and you, you couldn't imagine say someone saying okay look you, you know you've uh, they, they built the condo you you've, you've now got your 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 unit there and you say look sorry i know i paid for the you know the a few hundred thousand for this uh, uh unit in the condo but but actually i just want the cardboard i just want that the, the, you know the little piece of the cardboard model that would that be okay it doesn't make sense you know <laughs> the, the, the real condo is so much so much bigger and better in every way it's the real thing you know that then the model was just the model to help you to visualize what the, the real thing would be like yeah uh, but it was always about the real thing. That's the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament's the model, it's the shadow, it's the, the it's the picture, uh, it's the signpost, right? But it's pointing forward to the reality. If there's a shadow, then there's something that's casting the shadow, isn't it? Uh, but the bigger thing, the, the the thing that it's pointing to, it's not just a you know a two D you know black shadow. It's a it's an object, you know, height and in different colors and move and you know it's uh, it's so much better that that's that, that's the difference between the old testament and, and 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 the new testament and you can see how his argument is is working see how great jesus is the whole point of the old testament was to point to jesus jesus is here look how wonderful it is stick with jesus don't pull back um to to the model and he does this uh, uh all the way through uh the letter uh we need to uh, end here because we need to talk about the book of james but you can see some of these diagrams is 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 laying it out hebrews in summary remember these are from uh, uh from visual units and uh and i do have permission to use these so uh from visual unit uh first part focusing on jesus as god's son chapters one to four. Second part jesus as our great high priest uh and then as god's son he's better than the angels chapters one and two uh, and therefore don't drift away is better than Moses so and Joshua so don't harden your hearts here he's uh, better than the Levitical priesthood so don't fall away he's better than the Levitical sacrifices so don't shrink back you know persevere don't refuse uh, God who God who speaks and the next diagram here you, you know and unpacks um all of these things you know uh how, how is Jesus superior to the angels and superior to Moses and superior to to Aaron and superior to Melchizedek and, and all these things, right? It's it's there's a bit more detail that has there's in these following pictures. Uh so we don't have time to kind of go through 
you know, ch chapter by chapter to, to draw this out. You can do this in your own time if you like. But that's how the Book of Hebrews works. Here's how great Jesus is, how superior. So stick with Jesus. Don't fall away. So I'll exhort you by showing you how great Jesus is. I'll exhort you by warning you of the consequences of uh, turning from Jesus. Okay, I think that's all I want to say about the book of Hebrews. Uh, would you like to ask uh, any other questions there? Oh, um, I was just thinking about what you were saying, you know, predestination of the elect. So what would you say if someone asked you, um, if it's all predestined, the, uh, God's elect is already, you know, chosen in advance, how would that affect our enthusiasm for things like salvation and even from Hebrews like warning someone who is uh, who's about to fall away or has fallen away if everything is predestined and it's all going to be God's work and he will decide what's going to happen um, you know I, I, I tend to feel like you know it, will it dampen our enthusiasm in uh, sharing the gospel if it's all predestined already it's like no matter what you do it's it's all set it's it, it's a good it's a good question and what what uh we need to frame it rightly right so uh we need to to work out uh talk about god's sovereignty and human responsibility right mm -hmm. um and the way the armenian approaches it and says look uh Humans have free will. Therefore, God can't be totally sovereign in salvation. It must be my choice. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and my choice must be the definitive thing. Yeah. Um, now, the Calvinist does not, uh, does not say that people have free will. No. But it, it, neither does it say that we don't have human responsibility, right? So the Calvinists will say God is sovereign, but human beings are responsible, right? Human beings make real decisions for which they will be held accountable by God. Right? And these two things, uh, God's sovereignty and human responsibility, are, are presented in the scriptures as parallel or, or compatible truths. They're not opposites. They might seem like they're opposites, but they are compatible truths. Uh, sometimes I use a, an illustration to try and... Uh, show how this can go together of course any illustration has its uh, flaws right so i'm sure you can pick apart the flaws of this illustration but it may help you in some way right um so imagine one of you has a pet dog and when you have a pet dog yeah i used to have a pet dog uh, it was a maltese terrier uh you know very naughty um, not looked after very well by anyone in our family right uh her name was bobby i mean that is I don't know why it was a girl dog with a boy's name, but anyway, <laughs> um, that was my dog, right? So now, if I wanted Bobby, my dog, to go outside, what would I do? Well, probably I would get some uh, dog food, yeah, put it in a bowl, you know, let her sniff it, <laughs> and then put the put the bowl of food outside, right? Now, is Bobby going to go outside? Yes. Most likely, yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, did she choose to go outside? I mean, she's a dog, you know, so I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, they act on instincts, but did did a, did she choose to go outside? Mm hmm You know, I, no one was zapping her or, you know, kicking her out or... She, she made her own choice to go outside and get the food. But... Whose choice was primary? It was my choice, right? Because I I knew that she would eat the dog food, I put the dog food outside, let us so so that she would eat it. So it, it, there's a dual agency there, you see. There's a it, it, now the, the problem is that <laughs> then it makes God like human being and uh, and we like dogs, so that's not a very perfect illustration. But um, 
but you can it's meant to illustrate how you can have dual agency in decisions right and so to say that god is ultimately sovereign and that it's his uh, decision is the primary one it doesn't mean that we don't make real decisions ourselves i mean you make a decision whether you're going to turn in your assignment tomorrow or not and guess what if you write on your you know assignment submission form that it was uh, you know, it was. Uh, I was not predestined to uh, submit my assignment at, at Friday. And I'm going to say sorry. <laughs> I'm deducting your marks uh, because it's not an adequate excuse. We all know that we make uh, when we make real decisions, and that was your decision not to put it in, no matter how uh, creative you are with your excuse not to submit it. Yeah. So, and we understand this. I mean, that's why we have a law court, and that's why you can send people to prison. A person can't say, "Oh, I," you know. It wasn't really my fault that I killed him. It was God who determined that I was going to. It doesn't work like that. We make, human beings make real decisions, and on the basis of that, they are held responsible for it. And so the Bible says that you know, if you believe in Jesus, you'll be saved. If you don't believe in Jesus, you're going to you're going to be judged. Yeah, human responsibility. Real decisions are real accountability. At the same time, um, the Bible also says that God is sovereign, and that no one will ever choose to turn to Jesus in repentance and faith unless he has elected them and given them his spirit to change their heart and, and so on. And no one will persevere to the end unless God by his spirit perseveres us to the end too. Uh, they're both true, God's sovereignty, human responsibility, compatible truths. And the problem is when you deny one, uh, you, you, you so uh, emphasize one that you deny the other. Right? So in Arminianism, you so emphasize the human responsibility side that you deny the sovereignty of God. That's a problem possible to go the other extreme which is what you're suggesting here in terms of uh, hyper calvinism as it's called to say oh you know everything's all predetermined elect so therefore let's not do anything you know um no the, the, the if that's the point i mean if that's the case then why does paul write letters and what you know say with warnings and commands exactly. the, whole, the whole thing is uh, is uh, futile and stupid isn't it it doesn't make any oh. sense yeah oh. so we must reject hyper uh, calvinism that's not that's not correct um, you know, and I would argue we should also um, reject Arminianism too. I think uh, but Calvinism would, would affirm both of these things and see them as compatible, uh, compatible truths. Yeah. Mm. And it, it's different from how some people explain it, as in God knew in advance who would choose Him. This is not what you're saying, right? No, that's that's what Wesley would say. Yeah, mm. because. Uh, I mean, because the Bible teaches about predestination, we've seen that in um, you know, Ephesians and so on. But the way that Wesley explained predestination was that um, God chooses those that He foresees will choose Him. So in the end, it's our choice that's primary rather than God's. Yeah, that's how He explains predestination. Um, so if someone goes to hell, can they tell God, "You didn't choose me. That's why. That's why I'm not saved." No, they can't say that. They, the reason they're not saved is because they didn't believe in the Lord Jesus. Oh. Hmm. So you see these, I mean, you can look at Romans 9 to 11. I, uh, I, you know, Romans 9, the emphasis on election and God's sovereignty and salvation. And then Romans 10, um, the very next chapter about human responsibility. The need to, whoever believes, in, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Yeah. So... Oh. They're both taught clearly. They both they're both clearly taught in the scriptures, and uh, we need to believe all of the scriptures, not just the parts that maybe think fit with our thinking. And you know, this is not one of those easy. This is not an easy thing to think about. We could spend the rest of tonight talking about how uh, God's sovereignty and human responsibility fit together. Does someone asked me, like Judas, did he really have a choice? Oh. Was he chosen to betray Jesus? Both. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I say, but, you know, people ask and I, I don't think I can answer adequately. Yeah, it's both. It, it, it's both. So you see, um, you see in uh, John's, John's gospel, for example, I think it's John chapter six, uh, uh, that Jesus chooses Judas knowing that he will betray him. Um, it, of course, it's uh, the various gospels, uh, they, they point us to various Old Testament passages that predict that he would be betrayed. Um, and, uh, and in the Passion Predictions, Jesus says he's going to be betrayed and delivered into the hands of men. So it's quite clear that this happens according to God's plan. Yeah. At the same time, 
Judas makes his own choice. Pilate makes his own choice. The disciples make their own choice and, and, and so on, right? So, yeah, the cross is where you see this most clearly, where you have uh, each of the actors making their own decisions. Pilate, the Jews, disciples, etc., to to reject Jesus. No one's forcing them to do it. They do it because they want to. But mm. why does Jesus go to the cross? Is it just a political injustice? Is it just a tragedy? No, this is the plan of God, promised in the Old Testament, predicted by the Lord Jesus, and, and Jesus' uh, deliberate actions um, to save the world. It's it, it's both of those uh, to, to, together. Um, and Acts chapter 2 would be one passage that um, says that quite clearly. Acts chapter 2. Peter's preaching and he says this. Uh, Verse 23, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. There puts the two of them side by side. Why did Jesus die? Definite plan and foreknowledge of God. God was suffering. Why did he die? You killed him. Yeah. Both are compatible yeah. Mm. Mm. So, uh, you. I mean, uh, this is not your doctrine class. This is uh, something for you to uh, to continue to uh, reflect on as you as you study the scriptures. But it is an important issue as you come to the book of, of Hebrews because, in, in very much that that book is one of the key battlegrounds uh, for thinking about Calvinism and Arminianism. So it's good if you can, you know, hear the two the arguments either way. Thank you. No problem. Uh, Reverend Tim, can I ask? Uh, yes. There seems to be a big concern with angels, uh, especially at the beginning and a bit at the end. So, is there something that uh, knowing something is that something that knowing something about the Jewish context can help us understand why there's this concern? Yes, and. Uh... What, why the angels? I, I think you get a hint of that at the end of uh, chapter 2. Why is he talking about Jesus being superior to the angels here? I'm talking about Hebrews 2. Uh, let me read from verse 1. Therefore, we must pay closer attention to what we've heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, he's talking about the old covenant here, the law, right? The law given to Moses, um, Ten Commandments and the rest. Since the message to collect paid by angels proved to be reliable and every transgression and disobedience received a just retribution, how should we escape if we neglect such a great salvation declared at first by the Lord who attested it to us by, by those who heard while God himself bore witness? Um, so the point is, and this is what the Jews believed, I guess, is that, that the law came to... Moses and the Jews through the mediation of angels. Yeah. And what the writer of the Hebrews is saying, well, the gospel comes to us from the Lord himself, right? And his apostles, right? And so if the punishment was so great for the message that came from angels, how much more would the punishment be bad if you reject the message that came from the Lord? You see, that's the that's the argument here. So I think that's why he's talking about the angels at this uh, at, at this point. Yeah. Feel free to pick up a, a commentary on the book of Hebrews. Peter O'Brien's commentary is as good as it, you know, would be a good place to start. And uh, they'll, they'll talk about this at length. Yeah, maybe the pillar, pillar com commentary in Hebrews is really good. Mm -hmm.